say that how many terms all together would he serve? I know he's already served a well, partial term. Well, if he's reappointed tonight, he'll have served a partial term and he'll be appointed for a full term. And then it'll be up to him and the council at that time whether he serves a second full term. Okay, what is the term? Is that four years or two years? It is six years. I'm just asking. Yeah, sure. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second from Mr. Bernard Hill. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries, and we will carry that forth and appoint him later on in the agenda. Building naming discussion, Mr. Griswold. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, this council is in a very unique position, a very fortunate position, in fact, to uh, have several capital programs going to be coming online during our tenure. Things such as the uh, extensions to the um, recreation center, uh, the uh, parks and recreation facilities that are outlined in the master plans, some soup, future swimming pools, uh, perhaps the uh, public safety building, and various things internal to the public safety building that may warrant that uh, the city just names them individually. Uh, the uh, correction, that's right, Boykin extensions as well. Uh, right now, we currently have no process in place, so rather than debate that each and every time we consider a new facility as far as what we want to call it in the future, I thought that it would be appropriate for us to establish some procedures. And so with the council's concurrence, I would ask that we direct the staff to draft a process and procedure policy so that we can handle these uh, in the future when the, uh, the great opportunities come forward. Kelly, what would be some of the points that you would want to include in a procedure? What would be some of the objectives you would have? Um, I think the, uh, the objectives should uh, be people or families that have uh, long-term contributions to the city. And uh, in the case of individuals, I think we have to carefully consider whether we want uh, living persons or deceased persons to be honored. Uh, obviously, there'd be some kind of, of, of thing, such as uh, public safety. Obviously, we would have some, some living persons who are, uh, definitely would warrant having contributed to the point where uh, bodily injury and harm and whatnot, uh, perhaps even in you know, death in the past, uh, that, uh, that would warrant consideration. Um, I think because of the long-term implications of uh, any decision that we make that it should be uh, more than a simple majority but again I think all of these types of things are things that the city managers uh, and staff can come up with and we can discuss the particulars of it um, when the time comes. I did take the opportunity to forward another city's policies on naming of structures and facilities to Mr. Buston as a potential starting point. Okay. Any questions or comments from the rest of the council? Well, I personally, just from experience and seeing what our buildings are named and who they're named after, have no objection to how our buildings have been named in the past, and those all do require city council approval. And I'm just, my, personally, I don't think we need to instruct staff to take time to go through a process and hem ourselves into a procedure that may not um, come up with the best and um, most, I guess, best person or thing to be named after. So I personally don't think we should instruct staff to waste city, city resources and time when nothing in the past has happened that brings us to this conversation that I'm aware of that has been bad in the past. So, I mean, I think we've been... Um, Rocking along pretty well. So, okay. thank you, Miss Whitten. Anyone else from the council? Yeah, being new to this pr uh, process, um, one year on the council, I haven't uh, been privy to the process at all. Is it uh, something that somebody could provide us a uh, an uh, explanation of how it's occurred in the past? Well, this is my seventh year being up here, and I haven't been privy to it either because it hasn't happened in my turn. <laughs> Jim, do you have a historical perspective of? Uh, how these things have been named in the past that you could share with us? For the most part, they've either been, uh, and as you said, we've had very few, 
So they are very rare, and the previous councils has, have taken it very seriously when they're naming a facility after someone, but it is, it has been either uh, a member of the council who has, uh, or several members of the council who have, who have come forward with a recommendation, or it's been a citizens group who has come forward with a recommendation to the council, and the council then uh, decides if it's appropriate to do so or not. But as you said, it's been very rare. And when the council has participated, I presume they've had a discussion at a meeting and then they've taken a vote as a resolution. Yeah. Right, okay. there would have to be uh, officially uh, uh, an action made by the council. Sure, sure, okay. But have, have those recommendations that they've made in the past, uh, uh, does it land up with anything that Mr. Griswold suggesting? I'm like, um, Bob, I, I, we don't know what the procedures are. I mean, what are they recommending? How, how are they going about it? It would just be someone who felt that a certain individual was worthy of, of recognition by having their name associated with facility. So in our case, uh, Mr. Frank Brown was uh, the council nom uh, named uh, Frank Brown Recreation Center after Mr. Brown. Uh, Jan Dempsey Community Arts Center was named after uh, Mayor Jan Dempsey. This complex we're in right here, the uh, Douglas J. Watson Municipal Complex was named after a long sitting city manager. Uh, we've had a baseball field named after someone who worked in Parks and Recreation uh, for an extended period of time. Uh, <clears throat> we may have had one or two more, but like I said, maybe a handful of, of times in the last 23 years that I've been here that we've had uh, naming. So it's very rare and the procedure has always been very simple. Like I said, either a, a council member or a group of council members come up with an idea or a citizens group does. And they present that to the council, the council deliberates, they vote, and either yes or no. And Jim, is it fair to say that in the inverse, that if we wanted to rename a building, it would be the same procedure? With basically I would, yes. The council could consider and then based on our political philosophy of a majority making the determination. Um, and Mr. Griswold had mentioned a super majority potentially. Do we have any other requirements on voting that have such a heightened burden? There really is no law that we have that about naming buildings. So I guess you could come up to with your own. We have nothing else except for ordinances that require uh, well, that require at least six members to vote for it, wouldn't, no matter how many members are, are at the meeting. So that's about the only uh, policy I know about um, voting that we have that's different than just a, a regular majority. Is it common to, uh, for other cities comparable to us to have some type of formalized procedure with, with this matter? I don't know. I, I'm sure some cities do. I'm sure some cities don't. Again, maybe those who, who name things for people quite regularly might have a, a formal procedure to follow. In our case, we very seldom do that. Now, if this council wanted to become more active in naming things, maybe you know, then it would be uh, a good idea to have a formal policy. Any other thoughts from the council? You Mayor, may have any questions? Yes. If I may, one more time. Sure. Um, and this is strictly we're discussing buildings. Yes. I'm sorry. We're discussing only buildings. That's exactly right. Or internal structures. Or internal structures, meaning. Meaning rooms, conference within rooms, rooms uh, okay. city yep. cham council chambers. Yep. Uh, I, could, I, I might add, we do have a caveat here. We do get things donated to us every once in a while, like uh, the Dinius property, like Kiesel Park. Those come with a requirement that we name that facility after the donor, and that is part of the agreement. But even that has to come to council for council's approval. You can approve accepting the donation with the conditions that are set, or you can not accept the donation. <coughs> so even that has to come to council. Seems like we already have a procedure in place. I'm sorry? It seems like we already have a procedure in place to do this. It's been an informal procedure, yes. Have there been any problems with... Not that I know. Okay. 
So again, I, I may, may I? Sure, go right ahead. Again, I, I think we have, this is a unique situation, like I started this conversation, in that we have a number of facilities coming online in a short period of time, a number of a couple of years or so. Uh, so it's a, it's a good problem to have, and it's a unique opportunity for us to formalize those procedures, as have some other cities of our size. And I, and I support a robust debate on each one when we would decide to name one. If a group comes in, and a majority would make that decision. So I, I say <clears throat> support that. I think it's, a, it's important. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I don't see any harm in looking at what other cities our size do. I mean, I can't hear nothing. Just so I know. What was the other community, Kelly, that you sent the information in on? What was that? Uh, I'd have to go back and check the emails. I just did a quick search on Google, and numerous ones popped up. I sent Jim one uh, as a potential example of where to start. Okay. This is something I've looked into as well, and I can I can find information out on that. There's a mayor that I keep in touch with in Virginia, and they have a policy in place that I think is very good. At this point in time, I, from where I sit, I have no um, imminent nomination of a, of, of a person in this community to name a building on for in the very near future. Um, I think that's very important for the audience to understand that. Um, Mr. Griswold and I have had a, a debate through email this week about the living and deceased. I, I, I believe that if people are alive and they're worth honoring, that we should honor them and we shouldn't wait for them to, to pass on to do that, that they should enjoy that honor, their family should enjoy that with them, and if, they're, if, they're, if we feel so strong that we're going to put their name on a building, we shouldn't wait for them to be gone to make that determination. Um, this council and its past councils have done a beautiful job of naming things for people who have been great servants to this community. Um, one of those people is in the audience tonight. And um, all of those were very well put together decisions. Um, I wasn't around for any of those discussions, but my guess is that the council had very robust discussions about those determinations before they hauled off and named, permanently named a building for any of those people. Um, that's worked. If we're gonna consider naming a building for somebody and represent this entire community, we better be doggone sure we're right about it, we feel comfortable about it. And really, in a perfect world, it'd be great if the entire council felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, and I believe all of those situations, my guess would be, I can't promise you this, and I, we could go in the records and look into it, but I would guess that all of those were unanimous determinations when those buildings were named for those people. With that being said, I feel like our process is good. We could, if somebody feels strong enough to name something for somebody, that they can bring it up to this council, we can have a discussion about it, and we can make a determination about it. I, I, to me, that policy is good and it's in place. Um, I don't see the need for the staff to go and do the research on this because I feel like we've got a respectful, good policy in place that's going to account for all of our citizens and account for the people that we're talking about honoring and it's going to give everybody up here a chance to speak to it, up or down. So that's where I'm coming from. I certainly respect all the opinions of everybody up here tonight. and. Uh, at this point in time, we'll just ask the, the council if you would like to charge the staff with doing some research and developing some criteria to have a building naming policy for the city of Auburn. Is that, that's a mouthful, but is that kind of what we're looking for, ladies and gentlemen? Does that, does that sound right? Yes, to instruct the staff to do the research, <clears throat> to potentially create a policy that we would vote on that would be a building naming policy that would be for the city of Auburn. All right. I'm at a lot of research because I'm not for asking them to do it. I don't know what I'll, I, I don't know how much time it would take to do this. What I'm talking about is just seeing what other cities do. And you can do that by Googling that's going to take somebody some time to do it. I don't know if that's an hour or two hours or three hours. But All I'm talking about is everybody sitting at home and Google it. <laughs> oh, <almost>. us <laughs> do Well, <laughs> then we don't need instruction for that time. Take about 15 minutes. It makes more sense than asking these folks to do it. Well, the, the, the procedures we work with, <laughs> I appreciate you, Tommy. 
You always bring levity to our meetings, and I'm grateful for that. The procedures that we work under is asking the staff to con to take staff time to, to create things for us to debate and vote on. And so that's what that's what we're doing here tonight is we're having a discussion about whether we would like to instruct the staff to do that. Okay. I think we have an incredibly talented staff, and I don't anticipate um, this type of research to take forever. I think it's pretty uh, it's pretty straightforward type of work, and. Uh, I'd be all for it. All right, so if you would like for the staff to, uh, to do the research to create potentially a policy and some discussion points for us on um, creating a policy for, for naming buildings and municipal buildings, municipal properties within the city of Auburn, uh, please raise your hand. Just one, two, three, four, all right. That would be four, so I presume. If you, would, if you do not want the staff to, uh, to take time to do that research, please raise your hand. I'll do my own. Okay. <laughs> so that's five. Okay. Get back together and talk about it. <laughs> Absolutely. If everybody wants to do their own research and come back and bring this up again, then I'm certainly willing to talk about that. All right. Any questions on the agenda for the city manager? <clears throat> city manager, Mr. City Manager, do you have any questions for us or corrections? We do have one correction on the uh, regular agenda. Uh, Mr. Lockhart will not be here to receive uh, his service award for 15 years of service. Okay. I hope everything's all right, Mr. Lockhart. We'll get that to him later. Okay. All right, seeing no questions, do I have a move to adjourn? So Same. moved. All right. We all adjourn. <coughs> you ready? Everybody ready? All right, this time we'll open up the city council meeting for January the 7th, 2020. Roll call, Valerie. Here. 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 Please rise for the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Okay, being the first meeting of the month, it's our opportunity to recognize those employees who have done an outstanding job on behalf of you, the citizens. Um, and so tonight, we're very proud to recognize Miss Valerie Baker. And this is a memo from Megan McGowan Crouch, the Assistant City Manager, to Jim Buston, the City Manager. Valerie, would you please join me up here? Long walk for you. It is my honor and privilege to nominate Valerie Baker as the Employee of the Month for January 2020. Valerie was hired as an Administrative Secretary in the Office of the City Manager in October of 2017. She is the first person at City Hall that greets and interacts with visitors and is a shining example of an employee who is committed to providing quality work and service to our citizens, staff, and elected officials. Beyond greeting and assisting citizens and visitors, Valerie's job duties include, but are not limited to, compiling and distributing city council packets, assisting with voter registration in city elections, scanning and filling the filing of ordinances and resolutions, publishing and distributing updates to the city code, managing scheduling requests for the mayor, that's a tough job, and general administrative duties for the Office of the City Manager and City Council. She displays a high level of professionalism, attention to detail, and pride in the work that she performs. Valerie consistently and efficiently performs the duties of her job while always willing to take on new tasks. Recently, Valerie volunteered to be cross-trained to fill in for the assistant city clerk when needed. Cross-training included observing city council meetings, becoming familiar with roll call forms, and other 
council meeting paperwork, formulating a city council agenda, reviewing the council minutes, and learning other daily duties of that position. Valerie is an, ex is an employee that not only completes her t assigned task and duties in a timely manner, but one that anticipates additional tasks and takes the initiative to complete those tasks without being asked. She's also willing to provide unsolicited, valuable input and feedback to current processes and procedures that make them more user-friendly and efficient. Valerie takes her role in public service to heart with results that demonstrate the depth of her commitment. For these reasons, I highly recommend Valerie to be recognized as the City of Auburn Employee of the Month for January 2020. Ms. Ashley Simpson, would you please come forward? How are you doing tonight? Good. Good to have you. This is a memo from Mr. Al Davis, Community Services Director through Scott Cummins, Development Services Executive Director to the City Manager, Jim Buston. Please accept this nomination of Housing and Community Development Coordinator Ashley Simpson for an Achievement Award. Ashley joined the city in 2006, July of 2006, and continues to be a valuable member of the community services team. Ashley is very passionate about her job and people and the people that she serves through the Community Development Block Grant Program as she works with sub-recipients, homeowners, contractors, and other city staff. Ashley routine, routinely proposes and implements more effective means to perform the functions of Auburn's CDBG program. In doing so, Ashley demonstrates a thorough knowledge of the requirements of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for managing and distributing the CDBG appropriations we receive. Over the past four years, with the support from the city's educational assistance program, Ashley continued her value-added service while completing the work required to earn a Bachelor of Science degree in management from the University of Phoenix. Ashley, Ashley's efforts in balancing her duties with the city's CDBG program while pursuing this personal goal to receive a college degree is a great example of the quality staff the city employs is a great example of the quality staff the city employs to assure continued success for now and in the future. Earning her bachelor's degree is a major professional and academic accomplishment for Ashley and for the city of Auburn, and thus we are honored to nominate Ashley for an Achievement Award. Okay, for the 32nd consecutive year, if I could have Allison Edge and, and your staff, if they're here, to please come forward. Y'all doing good? Glad to have you. The City of Auburn, Alabama was awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for its 2018 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. The Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition for excellence in state and local government financial reporting. In order to be awarded a Certificate of Achievement, a government must publish an easily readable and efficiently organized 
Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. This report must satisfy both generally accepted accounting principles and applicable legal requirements. The Government Finance Officers Association established the certificate program in 1945, which is now recognized by financial institutions and rating agencies as the standard for external governmental reporting. This is the 32nd year the City of Auburn has received this designation. The Finance Department, along with auditors and other participating city staff, should be recognized for their dedication and effort in perfecting the document year after year. This continued achievement confirms that the City of Auburn's commitment to excellence in financial reporting and accountability to you, our public. Congratulations and thank y'all. Thank you all for everything. Y'all do a great job on behalf of all of us. We're very grateful. Okay, we have a very special uh, announcement we'd like to make right now. And I've, if I could have Miss Martha Hink from the Food Bank and Mr. Paul Grisham, Chairman of the Board of the Food Bank, please step forward. As an introduction, during the fall, we received some information at the city from an organization called the Extra Mile Organization. And it's a national organization that encourages municipalities to recognize outstanding individuals in their community that are going the extra mile to make your community special, to make it unique, to make it great. And so after a brief discussion, because it only took a brief discussion, um, we determined that we did have some extra mile people in, in our community. And we felt like in the first year of formally recognizing that, that we'd like to recognize Miss Martha Hink, who has done a beautiful job at our food bank. So during their December board meeting, I went out and read a proclamation that I'd like to read for you today. And then Mr. Gresham has something he'd also like to do from their board. Whereas Martha Hink grew up in the Congo, the daughter of Presbyterian missionaries where a heart for service was lived every day, and where she first served as the director of the Presbyterian Community Ministry, a longtime organization providing assistance to the needy in this area. And whereas in 1994, very wise people chose Martha to become a director of the Food Bank of East Alabama. And she has led this agency to great success. The Food Bank has grown from serving 45 agencies to serving some 250 agencies throughout East Alabama. And whereas it has grown from distributing 450,000 pounds of food in 1994 to distributing 5 million pounds of food in 2018. Much of this good work is due to Martha's public reputation for integrity, efficiency, and excellent decision making. Whereas all of Martha's effort to feed the hungry in East Alabama are done with commitment, conviction, and most of all, compassion. Whereas Martha is a community hero that goes the extra mile. Now therefore, I, Ron Anders, the mayor of Auburn, do hereby proclaim Wednesday, December the 11th, 2019 to be Martha Hink Day in the city of Auburn. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. At the same day, we had a little more business that we had to take care of for Martha. And, uh, but before I get into that, I want to say thank you to the city and to the mayor and for having us here and for, uh, for honoring Martha. I want to really thank you. For, for Most of you know we're moving into a new building. We're going from a building that has about 13,000 feet of uh, storage space to a building of about 40,000 feet. And... Uh, and uh, that's going to be tremendous for the food bank. Well, I certainly would like to thank those on the IDB board, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, Philip Dunlap and Art Shipman and all those that have worked so good with us to make this happen. But that's not why I'm here tonight. I'm here to read this resolution. The same board meeting, we, the board uh, unanimously passed a resolution, and I, I'd like to read the resolution to you. Whereas the Food Bank of East Alabama has grown significantly since its inception in 1994 to the point where it now serves thousands of residents in East Alabama that are food insecure, and whereas the Food Bank's mission is to feed hungry people, reduce food waste, and raise public awareness of issues related to food and hunger, 
And whereas during this past year, the food bank distributed over 4.5 million pounds of food through food pantries, community markets, shelters for the homeless, special residential facilities, after school programs, low income daycare of programs, and shelters for abused women. And whereas the Food Bank of East Alabama has developed a reputation as a highly efficient, effective, and trustworthy organization as evidenced by the thousands of volunteers and financial backers that believe in the food, pantry, food bank's mission, and whereas the success and esteem of the food bank can largely be attributed to the dedication and hard work of ex Executive Director Martha Hink, who has served continuously and faithfully since 1995, and whereas during Martha's 24 years of service, she has created a high profile for the food bank in East Alabama by her tireless efforts to establish extensive relationships for the food bank with countless organizations and individuals, and whereas many of the programs such as Community Market, brown bag program and the mobile food pantries that Martha has implemented during her tenure have targeted specific groups that would face hunger otherwise. And whereas because of the food bank success, it has spent the last year renovating a new facility that gives the food bank more than twice the capacity to serve the thousands of food insecure people in East Alabama. And whereas the Board of Directors of the Food Bank holds Martha in the highest regard and wishes to honor her for her hard work and good work that has led to the success, uh, su successful capital campaign and renovations of the new Food Bank building, now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Food Bank of East Alabama that the Food Bank's new facility located at 365 Industrial Drive in Auburn shall be known as the Martha Hink Food Distribution Center. An appropriate signage will be uh, erected to identify the building as such, dated the 11th day of December 2019, signed by myself. Thank all y'all and thank you everybody that uh, has served so well for us, our employee of the month and our finance staff and Ashley, what courage to work full time and, and go to school and get your degree. That's awesome. You're an inspiration to all of us. So thank you for what you've done. And thank you, Martha, and to the Food Bank Board. I think I see here a number of people who they are on the Food Bank Board and what y'all do on behalf of this community is, is unbelievable and what you've grown to is certainly um, inspirational as well and so thank you for your hard work and your continued hard work on behalf of our community we'll move on right now during the committee of the whole um, we appointed three people to the board of zoning and adjustment miss kimberly white and frost rollins to regular positions on the uh, the board of zoning and adjustment and mr jim storbeck is a supernumerary we'll confirm those later in the meeting for the waterworks board the council voted mr bernard hill who served a partial term to serve a full term we had a discussion about building naming buildings and uh, at this point in time, the council has not asked the staff to work on a policy for us, but Mr. Dawson, Councilman Dawson has encouraged all council members to be doing their own research. And if there are any, are any good ideas or thoughts that should be brought back to the council, then certainly all of us have the ability to do that at a later meeting. Okay. All right. Any other announcements from the council? Anybody? Yes, sir. Mayor. Uh, we'll have a Ward 2 meeting on the 23rd of January, be at 6 o'clock at the Public Library. Hope to see uh, Ward 2 folks there and anybody else that would, would like to attend. 
Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, I also have a Ward 1 meeting on January 14th, which is next Tuesday at the Borkin Community Center at uh, 6 p.m. And I encourage anyone to it and everyone to attend. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Anyone else? Mayor, I want to um, thank City Manager Jim Buston and the staff. I, I don't know to name the staff individually because I, I just have interacted with Jim um, on the I know I have a lot of folks in my ward that are happy about the closing at Sagahatchee, uh, that road. I know it's a temporary fix, um, but I think in the long term, I, I want to, that was a good, I thought it was good. We got a lot of people that commented on it. We were able to interact and, and get some good, um, good results, I hope. Um, but not only that, there's been about, in the last probably three days, three different things I've asked about uh, where I've had a citizen ask me, and within... At one point, within an hour, uh, but within half a day, there was a remedy or response. Um, and I just don't want to overlook that. Um, and I, I'm very thankful for that. I know the people who I, I get responses back are very thankful for that as well. Um, Jim, I thank you and your staff for just being so responsive uh, and trying to do the best for our citizens. So thank you very much for, for helping me with the issues I've had in my work. Anyone else from the council have an announcement or a comment? I, I, I do yes, I have one more. I want to also thank the Public Service Department for um, assisting with watch night on Highway 14 for those uh, for that church out there. And I did pass by, and the officer was sitting there. I say around nine because I was going to my watch night service. And when I came back through, it was probably about 12 or 30, so they were still sitting there. So I just want to thank public service for their, um, for the people protecting the community Good. doing watch night. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. I'd like to uh, congratulate Mr. Bill James for retiring soon. And uh, thank you for everything you've done on behalf of our community and for what a great career you've had here. And uh, congratulations to Paul Register, who will be taking your place. He'll have big shoes to fill. And uh, I know you'll get him ready for doing that. But congratulations, and we look forward to being with you here for the next few weeks as you finish out your time here at Auburn. Okay. All right, at this point in time is Auburn University Communications. I know school starts back tomorrow. Oh, you're here. You slipped in. I didn't see you. Good. <laughs> Good evening. I hope all of you had a great holiday break and a good new year. The only report I have is that students have arrived back in town and will begin classes on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Eagle. Yeah. <laughs> We're number five in the country, and that's pretty good, too. <laughs> all right. At this point in time, is citizens' communications for items that are on the agenda. Remember, these are only items that are on the agenda that you would like to speak to the council about. Please come forward and give your name and address for the record. Uh, you will have five minutes, but these are only items that are on tonight's agenda. I presume that there are people in our audience that would like to speak to us for some things that are not on the agenda. That time will come at the end of the meeting later on, okay? These are just items that are on tonight's agenda that you'd like specifically to talk about. No one? Okay, we'll move on. City Manager's Communications. Under city manager's communication this evening, our first item of business is a report on the expenditures associated with the Rebuild Alabama Act. By state law, it is required that I give you a detailed description of how we use uh, these funds. As noted in your memo in your packet from city engineer Allison Frazier, the city of Auburn has not received any uh, funds from the Rebuild Alabama Act, and therefore we have not spent any funds. Uh, however, it is required that in January I give you the report. And so we do expect that our first receipt of funds will be sometime this month. Uh, and so next January we will have a more detailed report of uh, the funds we receive and how we spend those funds. Do we need to uh, vote on anything, Jim? No, nope, just that. I just had to give you a report. <laughs> okay, good. All right, thank you. So our next order of business this evening is the consent agenda. Does any council member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda and deal with that item individually? Uh, yes, I would like to remove 8C4. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, I would like to remove 8C3. Okay. Anyone else? 
Okay, Mr. Buster, we'll go in order there, 8C3. Item 8C3 is a, a contract with Gonzales Strength and Associates to provide wayfinding at this facility, uh, including the public safety building, uh, the parks and recreation facilities, and uh, the downtown area. That's for a total uh, contract, all three of those together, a uh, total contract of $55,500. Move for approval. Huh? Second. I have a motion and a second discussion. Uh, yes, at our packet meeting, I was under the impression that this uh, would result in us purchasing some signs. But now that I've read the entire package that you delivered on Friday evening, I see this. We, we get no product for this other than uh, basically a map or locations of where the signs should go and the design of the individual signs. Is, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Let me let Becky address that. That is correct. It would, um, they would provide us with a template to use for all of the entrance signs and other signage for the parks and recreation facilities. And uh, it would also uh, include the template for all of the uh, wayfinding and signage for um, the public safety for the parking lot here on Glen for Felton Little and the connections to here and uh, to, from those to the Douglas J. Watson complex and then also some wayfinding for the downtown area. Okay, so so the end product of this is a piece of paper and some templates. It would be it would be the designs that we could use for all future projects that come online. All right. It's Additionally, it is some recommendations as to wayfinding in general, how best to to inform the public of where things are. Right. So there were some best practices, some consulting as part it's of this. A, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, I, I think that that more more in the lines of a, a Boy Scout Eagle Scout project than it is a fifty-five thousand dollar expenditure from the city. So I intend to vote no on that. Okay. And are there considerations with the American Disability Act when wayfinding, yes. things of that nature? So this would have to be up to law when they make these recommendations. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it'd be difficult for a Boy Scout troop to make this determination as to be lawful for the city. I I'm, I can't address that, but yeah, yes, but it, I'm, I'm it does have to be. Uh, it does have to be to to the specifications of the law. All right. So it's not just. There's. there's yeah. Okay. Thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Excuse me, Ms. Taylor. All right. Motion passes. Item HC4 is a memorandum of understanding with Auburn University addressing sidewalk and lane closures related to the construction of the Rain Culinary Science Center. Move for approval. Second. second. I have a motion in a second. Any questions or comments from the council? Yes, Mayor, if I may. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would just like to make sure that, um, first, that I think it's great that we um, are getting ahead of this and having a very comprehensive plan for this because it's going to be a lengthy process. But um, the closing of that section of thatch between Gay and College, correct? Um, just if you could briefly just walk through a quick timeline just so that we're aware and that the public understands what that means. And, you know, because I know generally we have angst when we start closing streets and sidewalks. And so, um we expect this to be, as you said, a lengthy construction process. <clears throat> We've been working with Auburn University to come up with a very detailed uh, street and sidewalk closure timeline based on the work we expect is going to be done. Um, let me let um, Scott Cummings, who has worked with Auburn University very closely on this timeline, let me let him give you an explanation on that.
Thank you. Um, yes, we've um, definitely worked with, with Auburn University closely with this. This is definitely something that we felt was very important, and that's why it's been brought to you tonight to make the decision on, on, the, on the closure. And um, due to the need for the closure of Thatch, um, we've tried to coordinate very carefully for known events that we had planned, which included through the Mardi Gras Parade, to make sure that would be open um, in order to facilitate that event. Um, we, you know, one of the key things, even though we would lose um, traffic flow, vehicular traffic flow through Thatch, we do have pedestrian traffic open on the sidewalk on the north side. That'll be open for the duration of the project, maybe some temporary closures for utility connections. And then um, obviously um, very important to us is maintaining uh, north and south traffic along College Street. And that became very uh, uh, critical to us to be able to negotiate that so we didn't in, in close that entire intersection down. So it's been a very carefully planned out project. We do appreciate uh, Auburn University facilities working with our engineering staff to uh, facilitate this plan. In your memo, there's uh, some detailed information you can look through that see that there it was careful planning to routing not only vehicular traffic but also pedestrian traffic around this during the time. And the primary objective there is for safety and, and as convenient as possible as we can make this during this time. Thank you. Scott, there's some um, the parking right there that that I guess Ingram Hall and Smith Hall access that comes off of Thatch Avenue, and then the Presbyterian Church has a student center right there that has some parking nearby. Do we have provisions for allowing those cars? One in? of the things that we stipulated was that the un the university work with the Presbyterian Church to secure adequate access to the church during the time of construction. So. That will be closed, but it will be open to the local traffic for to get to the church. Um, the additional parking <coughs> you mentioned is university parking that will be uh, unavailable during the during this um, through June July time frame, and then it will open back <coughs> up after that. But they're handling that internally with their employees. They are yes. Okay. What kind of what plan do we have to make the public aware of the street closure? I know that it probably could affect basketball to some extent maybe and then a day and different things like that um, I, and I got a good a mention of concern last night in my ward meeting but also an idea of, of potentially reaching out to alumni association or some just making sure people are aware of because this I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people that travel through our town whether they live here or outside are going to be wanting to come through this area well the university will be facilitating a lot of the communication for that and providing that to us we'll be sharing that we'll also be coordinating with them regularly our engineering staff we have inspection staff that'll be involved in this um, so we'll have that information with enough lead time to be able to communicate um, you know any any of these closures that'll be on, on our public facilities uh, the university already has uh, display boards that are out um, in addition to that but that is a good point on the university on, on the alumni association for those coming into town for events and I mean will we do something similar like we did for the Glenn work where we kind of posted something to the city web Facebook and we will put out we'll, a map that kind we of will. We, and we also uh, make sure that this information is available and it's usually picked up by uh, the, the the Google mapping uh, thing so when people use those automated uh, especially people from out of town that's trying to get uh, to places in town it will automatically show that that is not a way to go any longer that it routes them around that way because those areas are closed uh, and we do that pretty regularly and it's pretty we can't guarantee that it's picked up but it's pretty regularly picked up is something that'd be an open line as well yes yeah and and it needs we we have plans as you see in that timeline we have plans to continually put it out as the plan uh, as we work that plan thank you Jim just kind of as a redundant refresher can you kind of communicate to us about the relationship that we have with the university's facilities and project staff and how we meet with them on a continual basis and discussion of this project just kind of a summary of that so as you can imagine um, you know with with a major university sitting right smack dab in the middle of of our city it is important that we can co uh, coordinate uh, construction projects so we do meet with uh, facilities staff um, every quarter and we have a fairly lengthy meeting where we go over everything that we're doing and as far as uh, uh, projects utility projects road projects construction projects and they go over with us everything that they're doing and what they're planning uh, in addition we have sitting in in the back of the room here uh, mr. Steve Pelham 
who uh, comes to those meetings and he's also coordinates uh, conversations uh, between the city staff and, and university staff. And we have a very close and very, um, very dynamic um, conversation pathway. And so the two of us, or the two entities are always speaking, making sure that we each know what each other is doing and, and doing our best to stay out of each other's way, but also doing our best to make sure that we coordinate projects that, uh, in this particular case, there's some utility work that we wanted to get done. We're going to do that uh, utility upgrade because the roads are going to be closed anyway. So we're going to do some projects that we had in, had planned, but are going to do them in this time frame. Uh, so, and I'm sure that they do the same. Could you? Does that include the upgrades at Thatch and Armstrong yet, or Gay? I'm sorry. No. That'll be later. You know, I'd remind the public this is a substantial project. It's going to be about two years, I believe, to complete. For the construction of the rain center, we expect that that will be closed, entirely closed for about four months, and then it'll be open and closed different times. But I, but I do understand that it'll be a, a great resource for our entire community, even though it's a university facility and going to have university programming in there. I believe that there's going to be some great opportunities for all of our community to have to experience this facility. So it should be a, a great plus for all of them. But it is going to be a substantial project. It's going to take a while to get built. Okay. Any other comments from the council? If not, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And that motion carries. Those are all the items we have for the uh, consent off the consent agenda. All right. Do I have a motion to approve the the balance of the consent agenda? One thing, real quick, and I, this may not require, but you had mentioned at our packet meeting. I think the public would like to know with the acquisition of the 560 new push carts, we're going to be at 85 percent, correct? On we'll have we'll have once we get the once we get those carts in and distribute them to the people who are waiting for them, which will complete our distribution, we will have 85% uh, adoption rate for recycling in Auburn. All right, I didn't mean to take that out of turn. I just remember that was a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we have a motion second. All in favor to approve the balance of the consent agenda, please say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? The consent agenda is approved. Under ordinances this evening, we have item 9A as an ordinance amending city code chapter 13 to make it illegal to trespass in a motor vehicle. A public hearing is required. Before we begin, Ms. Witten, would you once again give us a refresher on what we'll be doing tonight? First, we'll open the public hearing. That's what we do first. And then secondly, we will um, have someone um, introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. If that is um, unanimous and no one denies unanimous consent, then we, we will then, in essence, waive the first reading and move on to vote on the ordinance, which requires a motion to vote on the ordinance and a second and then a majority for approval. All right. At this time, I'll open the public hearing. If you'd like to address the council on this subject, please come forward and give your name and address for the record. Okay. Seeing no one, we will close the public hearing. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. We have a motion and a second. Does anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with a vote on this this evening? Are there any questions? This is an unusual ordinance. Mr. Buston, would you quickly give us a reason why we're considering this tonight? I could, but I think our municipal judge is in the room. That'd so be great. Well, that'd be even yeah. better. I'm going to let him. <coughs> Thank you, Council. Uh, we've had a recent rash of, uh, especially one gentleman who likes to get into vehicles with college students and tell them his car is broken down. Could they drive around the corner, jump his vehicle off, and after several minutes, we realize there's no vehicle. He's just using them as his own personal Uber, if you will, um, and he drives them around the city. Um, he never puts his hands on anybody, never threatens anybody, but you've got terrified college students with a, a gentleman in their car they can't get rid of. And we've been trying to resolve this issue for probably five or six months now. Uh, there's no law in the books that makes anything he does illegal. Uh, and we think that this is a good way to, to fix that loophole, if you will. Uh, all the trespass laws in the state of Alabama deal with real property and dwellings. Um, 
there's probably four or five, I found four or five, I think, states that actually have a law similar to this to try and fix this loophole. And uh, mainly we're just trying to keep our citizens, especially our college students, safe uh, and, and prevent this from continuing to go on. As a sideline, uh, I think Bill James, the Public Safety Department will tell you they also have a lot of people that go around shaking door handles at night and uh, because people tend to leave their cars unlocked, taking things out of unlocked vehicles. This will give the Public Safety Department another avenue to try and deal with that issue as opposed to having to take it out to the county and make it a felony for breaking and entering. So we think it's a good way to, to stop several problems with, with one new ordinance. Thank you there, Judge. Appreciate it. All right, any questions from the council? Comments? I got a question. Sure. So that person, is it the same person or is it the same person doing the same thing? Yes, ma'am. It's, it's the same person. Uh, been caught down here and ain't nothing y'all can do about it? Is that what you're saying? Well, he's been banned from every grocery store and every gas station in the city. And if he trespasses on one of those, then I certainly can deal with him and put him in the county jail. But as long as he's continuing to go through this same process of getting in a vehicle, basically they, they open the car door and he gets in the vehicle with them. And at that point, he hasn't broken any law that's on the books. And as long as he doesn't put his hands on them or threaten them, he hasn't broken the law. So this will stop him from intimidating physically or otherwise these students and will give us a way to redress this and hopefully stop him from doing it. But it is the same individual. How did y'all come up with the fine or punishment? Is that just a state thing or? There is no state law. I'm sorry. There is no state law. That was a uh, decision that was made between myself and the public, uh, excuse me, the city attorney. Um, it, it's pretty much the standard punishment for any ordinance violation, which is up to a $500 fine and up to six months in the county jail. But that is pretty much standard across the board for an ordinance violation. Thank you, Jim. Any other questions? Any comments from the council? So we have a motion is second. So roll call. Yep. We we don't we don't have a motion in second yet. We don't. No, we just no. Um, we just approve just unanimous the, consent. Okay, Mayor. I, th I think what we should do is um, instead of asking, does anyone ha have a problem or does anyone deny unanimous consent? We should just go ahead and take a vote for unanimous consent. A roll call vote for unanimous consent. Okay. So we didn't do that, so we should do that. I'm sorry. So we need to take a roll. You're suggesting we take for, a roll call. For no one did deny unanimous consent, but All right. we, what we have been doing is voting on that now. So right. let's go ahead, instead of just asking if anyone denies unanimous consent, let's go ahead and vote on that. Okay, that's fine. By roll call. By roll call. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Smith. Uh, By voting to deny unanimous consent? <laughs> no. No. Uh, for unanimous consent. You're, you're voting for unanimous consent. Unanimous yeah. consent. You're voting to move this forward tonight. You're voting to basically to suspend second reading. So there we go. That's what I was looking yeah. for. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Dawson. Yes, ma'am. Dixon. Yes. Griswold. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And now we would entertain a, a motion and a second, uh, and then another vote. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second, um, and this would be just a voice vote. No, it would still be a roll call. It'll be a roll call. All right. We do have a motion and a second. All right. Carson. Yes. Seth. Yes, ma'am. Taylor. Yes. Whitten. Yes. Johnson. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Griswold. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Mayor, those are all the items we have on the agenda this evening. All right, at this point in time, it's an opportunity for Citizens Open Forum. This is an opportunity for you to address the council about anything that might be on your mind. Please give your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes to do that. Yes, sir. Three for my name and address? <laughs> uh, Robert Brennan at uh, 241 Jerome Court, Auburn, Alabama. <clears throat> and I have a group of people over here who are all with me, uh, and they may individually speak as well. So the sudden closing of the Health Plus Fitness Center is the issue. Uh, we'd like to 
bring it to your attention because it's a wellness and a health center for our citizens. <clears throat> we understand that the, the hospital has the right to close this facility and we understand that you don't control whether or not they close this facility. That's obvious. I don't think everyone was aware that this is the only indoor large heated pool to 85 degrees in the city of Auburn. Because it's been suggested to us that, well, it's closed, just run over to Opelika. Well, it's closed, just go to the Auburn University community pool. Neither one are kept at 85 degrees. Now, why is this important? You can see some of the people here. But I'll just tell you that we have people that have ALS, we have an amputee, we have people that have severe arthritis, we have babies that are learning to flip over and not drown in this warm water. This is a real plus for retirement community that we think is first class. We love Auburn. We think Auburn needs this pool. So what can we do? I think there's an easy solution that maybe has been overlooked. Why don't we have the city of Auburn lease the pool area only from the hospital and then Auburn does a lease that's perhaps month by month so if you hit an extraordinary expense you cancel the lease so you're not going to get hung with anything unusual on the other hand at the same time we would like for the parks and rec to build an indoor facility similar to what Opelika has, but have it kept at 85 degrees so that it can be used by all of these citizens that need the warm water. This is, it's a crime to have a pool already built, still working, and to say, fill it up with concrete when you got all these people that basically have nowhere to go. They're gonna have to go over to Opelika. And we don't wanna drive to Opelika. We would rather stay right here in Auburn. So, we're first class, we'd like to stay first class. I'll be glad to help in any way. I've not spoken to anyone at the hospital. I have no idea if they would listen to this, but surely they don't have enough doctors already hired to fill up that building and that facility that they need the pool right this moment. And as a fallback, if you can't do that, please, please, please rush an indoor pool for us. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Happy New Year, Mayor Andrews, ladies and gentlemen of the Council. Herbert Walter Dinbar, Jr., 412 Opelika Road, Apartment 111. Um, my uh, comments tonight um, are concerns that uh, the city in 2020, with the comprehensive 2030 plans that in uh, place right now, to work to keep the basic infrastructure needs of Auburn, particularly in places like Northwest Auburn. Um, would, and I'm sure the people of Northwest Auburn would like to thank you for the improvements of the past, but you have heard many of them speak on issues like affordable housing, how Z CDBG money is being spent, about the need for a library branch, the situation involving um, Drake Middle School, the new one, and what's going to happen to the old one, and plus the normal stuff like streets, roads, making sure no places get flooded out in cases of weather, and stuff like that. I'm just hoping that, as a general rule, at least make sure that our basic infrastructure is fixed because, you know, a lot of projects are going on. But if the basic infrastructure is not good, everything's going to crumble, literally and figuratively. And I'm sure all of us in Auburn don't want that, and that's the major concern that I have. And I thank y'all very much, and Happy New Year. Who would be next? Good evening, Carolyn Matthews, 622 Ogletree Road. Um, I'd like to address the pool issue too. I think, as Bob said, we're still stunned. It was done so quickly and unexpectedly. And um, we've been lucky to live in a community that has a university and a lot of the needs of citizens, you know, have been for a, a pool, have been met by the university. And then Health Plus has met those needs. 
a, a wonderful facility, a beautiful pool used by many people. Uh, now we're being told that our desire to use the water for exercise or physical therapy or whatever, we have to go to Opelika. And it's a wonderful facility too, Sportsplex is. For some, the distance is a problem. Uh, again, the pool temperature is a problem, <clears throat> especially since we have so many elderly arthritis. I had to quit going to the pool for a few weeks in December. It got too cold. I've been sick. Um, I looked into the offerings of the pool in Opelika, and they're so restricted compared to what we're getting. There, there are five classes, all at 9 o'clock, <coughs> the same class. We have 13 classes that address a variety of fitness levels from people with arthritis, seniors, people who want more, a more strenuous type of exercise. Uh, we have people doing physical therapy. Uh, we, like I said, we have 13 classes at a variety of times of day. So we, we just wouldn't get that. And I think Auburn has done an excellent job in providing recreational facilities in most every area. I was on the council when we built the tennis center, the soccer complex. I think the one area that we have failed is in a pool for the citizens, particularly a covered heated pool that can be used year-round. At the most, as Bob said, the most we would like was some kind of meeting with EMC to see if it could be kept open during an interim period. At, the, at least, I understand long-range plans, how important they are, goals, but that the priority of a pool be moved up because there are many, many citizens that use and um, I think we need to stop relying on other people to meet these needs of the Auburn citizens. Thank you. Can I ask a question on that? Sure. Is there uh, any way that we could speak or get some information on, you know, maybe doing a lease with Health Plus? They have in the past, I know that they lease space for the Exceptional Foundation. Um, I, I do believe that that is a that is a need for uh, a group of people there. Um, I, I used to work out at Health Plus a long time ago. It's a wonderful facility. I know that they're changing, they're moving that space, but I think that there is a huge need for people in our community with a swimming pool. And I, I think it would be worth our time looking into seeing if we can talk to EAMC and and have a lease agreement. I can answer that question. It's, it's, yes, we can ask that question. There's no, I mean, we can ask that question in the morning. Um, I've understood that they've made plans, but that doesn't mean that we can't ask them to, to stop those plans and, and rethink what they're wanting to do. Uh, Jim, I don't know, has anybody on the staff, staff seen their renovations of the building? Do we know, has anybody talked to us about that? We have no idea what that would be. I, I've not I seen so. it as well. I, I will say, Mayor, that we, do have plans for an indoor pool yep. at uh, Boykin Community Center. We intend to uh, fast track that as soon as we can find some land to, and we are actively looking, uh, as you know, it's in the budget for us to get some land uh, to move public works and environmental services off that property. And we would come back to you with, with an, uh, a plan to move that uh, that pool to the forefront as soon as we can we can get it started. But that also helps us with the branch library that we have planned for there. It also helps us with the uh, Rosa Parks uh, museum, museum that, that yep. Councilman sure. Dawson had brought up. Sure. Are there any other citizens who would like to address this on this address this on this issue? Yeah, please. My name is Slayton Crawford. I'm a member of Health Plus, have been for a couple of years, and I just wanted to say that uh, it's a first-class facility. It's being closed. We've heard all of the details. But I wanted to add one thing. Sometimes in communities, I'm a former hospital CEO, that there are facilities and services that only can be provided 
by a public institution or mother house. Evidence this facility was built by the hospital. It's big enough, it's accredited. An accredited facility, everything under the umbrella of an accredited facility has to be accredited to it in the same manner. Therefore, that's the reason it's such a great facility. It's clean, it's well run, and it provides a service. The heated saltwater pool, there's another one around. There's not another one around. I understand the one in Opelika is a cold water pool. The health benefits of a saltwater pool for exercise, cardio exercise, and multiple types of ailments that it benefits is, is necessary. But the point I want to make is a public institution, a large public institution that is able to subsidize if necessary is required to have something of that size in a community. The private enterprise is not going to provide it. And it has to be subsidized like, a, subsidized like an ambulance service or anything of like that sort. I just wanted to bring that point for whatever it's worth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. And I want to ask a question too. Mr. Crawford, hold on just one second. What was your address, Mr. Crawford? Your address? Your address. Thank you. We just need that for a minute. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Sorry to sorry, Connie. Please That's go ahead. That's okay. That's okay. Well, I guess my question is, and I understand that there's a indoor pool coming to uh, the Borkin area over there, but is it, it is it the type of pool that's going to accommodate their needs? Because I, I was understanding if this is going to be a regular pool, but is it is it going to be designed to accommodate what they're asking, like the heat I'm, heat part of it? I'm I'm not sure what the requirements would be. Um, you know, we're not a health facility, so if there were to be some type of of therapeutic program, we would have to know what those requirements are and then it would be a decision of the council at the time to decide if you wanted to expend the money to whatever that is to make that addition. Uh, now we expect it to be a full service aquatic facility. What that means I don't know. Like I said, we never contemplated a health facility but that's not, doesn't mean you can't contemplate that. So Jim, basically what we've said is we, we see having an indoor pool at that site but we've not decided if it's going to be a pool for competition a pool for therapy a pool for lessons a pool for casual swim or something all above we just think that there we just believe our commitment a, our goal right. is to have an indoor pool with that there's site. a general a general plan from the parks and recreation okay. master plan of what to pull there make it a, a full-blown aquatic center more akin to what's in Opelika uh, but again I can't I can't talk to the therapeutic pool needs because I don't know what those are. But again, if there's, you know, if, if that would be something that the council would want to pursue when we come up to design, if there's a, you know, a separate, uh, as I heard one of the gentlemen say, a, a saltwater pool that has to be heated to 85 degrees, what the size of that is, uh, I'm, I guess I understand if I, from what little I know about what happens at Health Plus, it would have to be some type of shallow pool where you can actually you're not swimming, but you're actually standing and, and doing aerobics or whatever, water aerobics type thing. Right. And I, I only asked the question because it was thrown out there about their pool from Boykin on their conversation. So, you know, I, I don't want to send false hope that that's what, you know, that pool is built for. So that's why really, I'm asking the question because it never came up, I guess. So, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to be a council member that says that this is going to happen, but then at the end of the day, that's not that's not the reason that it happened to accommodate the needs of what y'all are asking for. So let me ask you this to sure. get the city to talk to EAMC maybe tomorrow or sometime this week. Is that something that we need to vote on, or is it something that they can do and report back to us and then that gets that doesn't take any council action to do that does it no. okay we can do that okay how soon would we get the information back on if that's something that uh, the hospital would be willing to do Stephen, i it'd be a little ambitious for me to suggest when they might 
give an answer. It could be immediately, or it could be they might have to have. I don't know. I wouldn't want to be suggestive. Sure. That's I, I, fine. That makes sense. Uh, it, it should be. The, they have never approached us with any uh, plan at all. They have had plans for that facility. Uh, when I did reach out to the CEO of the hospital, I was told that they were closing that facility because it was not. They had lost a lot of of their uh, membership. Membership, and, right. and that they were closing it because it wasn't economically viable to keep it open. That they are going to open a uh, something in Auburn Mall. It's not going to be a pool, but it's going to be something with uh, right. some type of health facility in in the Auburn Mall. Uh, what I'm asking is, I would like to see the pool stay open if possible. If we could get a lease agreement, like um, Bob suggested, I think that I think we would we would we could talk to them. Any expenditure of money would have to come back to council. Right. I mean, staff cannot make that decision, and the council would have to decide. They would probably have to decide from their board members if they were even care to to entertain that idea. Uh, I don't know. I, I think it's worth looking into. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. I'm Susan Sullivan, and I live at 1980 Canary Drive here in Auburn. Um, many small things um, have been spoken about tonight regarding the pool at Health Plus. Uh, just for your knowledge, um, we're not talking about just fitness here. We're talking about lives of children in our communities. Um, I've been a member at Health Plus for 10 years plus and children are learning all the time how to not die if they fall in the water. We can't put a price tag on that. Okay. Uh, another thing is yes, the pool is a pool that has been built to be approximately four foot deep so that we have swimmers who can do lap swimming and between it being a shallow pool all the way across the pool and not having um, a depth of more than four feet it allows for a large area for us to do different kinds of programs in the water so we have a lot of health benefits from that um, we do have people that are there that it's already been spoken of where they are having physical therapy in the water. Auburn residents deserve a place to go to that is safe, that they can get the physical therapy they need to sustain their lives. So it's not just a matter of, oh, we're going to go, we're going to have fun, and we're going to feel good. It's a matter of life and death for some of us. Okay. For myself, um, I've been going uh, faithfully for the last year. I've taken off a considerable amount of weight, and I have been able to get off all of my diabetic medications. I feel like that's huge. I would rather spend my $1,000 a month supporting my Auburn community than just paying for my medications to survive. So, um, yes, I'm being a, a diabetes advocate here. Um, and that's just one of many, many things that people deal with. So, in, in, in the progress of building a pool, I hope those kinds of things will be taken into consideration. You don't have to have a pool that's deep to get the benefits that we need, but we need we need heat for people that have like fibromyalgia. Babies are not going to want to get in water that is cold. So um, thank you for your time. Else? My name is Gilbert Rivera. I live at twenty two twenty five Mount Vernon Lane here in Auburn. I've been going there for 20 years. My wife's been a head instructor there for 20 years. You know, couldn't these people at the city here think about something like keeping it open at least until they build a pool? That's something that needs to be looked at. 
You know, if they're going to build a pool and everything, that's fine and great. They're going to spend a lot of money at the cities. They could keep this pool open and keep it going, and they wouldn't have to build the pool. You know, uh, what is it, rehab works or whatever is going, moving in there into part of the, the facilities. You know, if they're going to do full rehab and stuff, they're going to need a pool. Because there's a lot of people, they, they're not here tonight because they can't come here. They're very in wheelchairs and stuff. But with that pool has extended their lives by having them get exercise that is very necessary. Need you to really think about those things. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Sarah Orgel, uh, 1629 Overhill Court here in Auburn. My husband is an extreme. Um, he has ALS, and it's the slow-progressing kind. And this is a true story. We lived here 40 years ago because he coached football. And some of you I remember from way long time ago, and some of you weren't born yet. But... Um, he did really not want to move back here eight years ago. But we were in Albany, Georgia, and we had such fond memories of Auburn. And we came for a football game, and it was one of the reunions, and he had such a good time. And we just, I don't know, I insisted that we give it a whirl. And he was very confined to the house, and it was killing all of us to see this happen and so before we even looked for a house I did my homework and Sally Dean helped me of course and we first went to Health Plus and that was the turning point for Frank because he could see a life for himself and he could still go to football practice as long as he could and swim because he can't get on a machine. He's not the only one. I mean, he has to be lifted. But guess what? He, he's a new man and he, he gets in that water and it changes his whole life. He has been swimming three times a week. Now he's down to two for two hours with a therapist. Now, we would be seriously in debt, except that Health Plus has this cooperation with Rehab Works, and for Frank to be able to swim and for us to pay a copay, we have to have that, and it has to be a real PT. It can't be a trainer, it has to be the degreed person. So it's a lifesaver. And I think a lot of people in, in our community don't even understand that. But we need that so badly. Frank isn't the only one, for heaven's sakes. And I think you are wonderful to consider it. I, I don't even know who you are, Stephen, but for you to even care that much about us older people and our needs, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Orr. Hi, um, I'm Frances Smith. Um, I live at 618 Seminole Street here in Auburn. And I just recently moved here from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm a physical therapist, and I specialize in aquatic therapy. I've been doing it for years and years and years. And um, it, I've seen what it does for people's lives. And I was so excited when I came to Auburn and saw that there was a warm water pool here. So I went to EAMC. I became a physical therapist there, working for Rehab Works. Just started doing patients, and then wham, you know. So. Um, I know what it does for people. I would be willing to help anybody. I'm very, I know a lot about pool design. I know a lot about the types of people, the types of temperatures that help certain types of people. And I just think it's a real shame if there's just not a way that 
you guys can help the hospital. The hospital does great work. Um, they see every kind of patient that needs therapy, and it just became too costly, and I understand it. So pleading. <laughs> help them out if you can, because I think it's a unique thing that Auburn has. It's something that should be saved if possible. So I'd be willing to help with any kind of suggestions or anything. Okay? Thank you. Thank Welcome you. to Auburn. Mm -hmm. Ken Busby, 280 Ivy Lane. Hey, um, I have no idea, no doubt that y'all will be able to help with the pool. Um, y'all do great work for the city, and you put the citizens first in everything you do. Um, so I look forward to seeing what y'all can do with that. Um, my big thing is uh, citizen surveys coming out, and whenever I was here a few year, uh, a year ago, um, we talked about um, boards and commissions and non-residents being on it. Uh, I talked about a survey that I'd put out online and uh, um, it wasn't taken that it was an, a, a good enough survey because of the way it was, it was done online. Um, and I brought up the suggestion that we add it to the citizen survey. Uh, a question about whether or not non-residents non um, should be on boards and commissions. Uh, and I think that would be a great question to add to it. It's going out, it's been printed. What's a few, you know, cents on ink for an extra question? Um, and I think it would be important to see what the citizens actually think about that. Uh, and, and, you know, y'all can do with it what you want to whenever it comes back. If you don't want to do anything, that's fine. Nope, either way. Um, but that's kind of my, my thoughts on that, and that was my thoughts on it then. I just wanted to bring it up as those are getting ready to go out um, to have that question added on there. And then for the naming part that uh, Kelly brought up, you know, there's, you know, Mike Hubbard Boulevard that's still got his name on it, and we see how well that went uh, as far as naming things. Um, so, you know, whenever, you know, you, you think about it, you know, let's, let's put something down on paper and get some things done to where something like that doesn't happen. That's a black eye, a slap in the face to everybody that drives through there. Thousands of people drive past that every day. And you got a felon's name across the main road that thousands of people see every day. And I would hate to see that happen to another building. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, can I respond to you? Absolutely. Well, hold on. I'm Helga Wilmoth. 1233 East Samford Avenue and I too want to speak about the pool. I have been a member there since 2001. I am 87 and a half years old. I have two replaced hips and I'm in the pool six days a week every morning and uh, can jump around and exercise and walk as much as I want to, which I could not do on land. And I want to uh, tell you that it is four feet high, which makes it easy for people to swim. You can just move over the lane lines, a couple of them, or two, if you need to. And we have water zumba, aqua zumba, we have water in motion, we have a variety of uh, stretch classes for the uh, people with arthritis. I was the German teacher at Auburn High School, and some of you might remember that, but uh, this has been my help, and as you see, I'm strong. <laughs> I'm 87 years old. Mr. Jackson, before you come up here, Mr. Parsons had something he wanted to say. Go ahead, Mr. Parsons. I just wanted to respond to the gentleman, Mr. Busby's uh, questions about um, the citizen survey and what, and just ask uh, Mr. Buston about what is the general procedure, where does that content for the questions come from, does the City Council have an opportunity to um, uh, make suggestions or comments on the content of it? Once we have put together the survey base 
line, there are some certain questions that we want to ask every year to get a uh, a trend line for for certain things. Uh, but then, yes, you will be getting before we put it out. You will be getting the base survey to see if there are any questions in there that you don't want to ask and if there are any questions that the council as a body decides they want to add to it. Now, we have to work with the, uh, with the company to make sure that we ask the questions in such a way that they're not biased in getting an answer one way or the other and the company helps us with forming the questions. So if the council says they want to ask a question about X, Y, or Z, we present that to the to the company, and then they will formulate a question to try to get a statistically valid answer to that question. Thank you. But council will have the opportunity. Now we are limited as well to the. It's a six-page survey, and it has to stay at six pages. So, you know, we can't just ask a ton of questions, but we want to ask questions that that need to be asked for whatever. Um, projects or, or things that are on the council's mind that they want to get citizen input from. Mr. Mayor, can I follow up on that? Absolutely. Um, so if we have citizens that contact us with suggested questions, I understand what you just said. The procedure to add a question to the uh, survey resides up here with, with the council. Correct. Um, and do we have a timeline as to what the cutoff date might be for gathering input for those types of questions so that we don't push the survey down the road somewhere? We have to have the survey out by the end of January. Okay, so we are, we are trying to get it out to where we can give it to you, uh, which is almost ready. I will send it out to the council and then as council members can decide I mean, we, in the past, we've never had really an issue with the council members have always been fairly uh, in agreement as to one or two questions that they wanted to ask, and it's been very targeted at, at certain things. Uh, I don't know what this council will do, and I don't know how much time that will take, and I don't know how much controversy there will be, uh, but we would like to get the, <coughs> the survey out by the end of January. And the reason for that, Jim, is because it impacts our budgeted process, which is this summer, which would begin for the staff. There are two, summer, reasons that, that, the, two reasons. Two reasons. It impacts the budget. We want to get it back by the budget, but we also want to get uh, the survey out when the majority, when students are in, in session, when the majority of the people are here. We don't want to do it at a time that, that we won't have students here. And this is a perfect time. Students are just back. They're just starting again. Uh, all the there are no real holidays that to take people away so this is the perfect time to do the survey so procedurally uh will will be an action taken here at the, at the city council as far i would as, imagine uh, we would have a work questions? we'd probably have a work session uh, and that would probably be prior to the next city council meeting i would assume if you need to get it out by the end of january you think or, or it could be prior to the next council meeting or after the next council immediately after the next council meeting, something in that time frame, as long as we can get out by the end of January. Council meeting is on the 21st, so that's 10 right. days. So the citizens have an idea then, a rough time frame. They, if they have something they want to bring forward to a council member, they probably ought to do it, you know, tomorrow, right away. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, my comment would be to our citizens, if there's something you'd like for us to consider putting on the survey that you contact your council rep or me, myself and, and let us know what question it is and why you think it's valid, important, and we'll certainly consider that as a body. I think just as important, even more important, when you receive that survey in the mail or you're called on the phone or, or the, is email a possibility, Jim? Yes. To, to answer the survey. Don't blow it off. Don't put it in a stack and forget about it. We, we need your information. We need your input. So take the time to, to fill that in and participate. Um, before Mr. Jackson comes up here, I just want to make some, some comments about Health Plus. So, Ms. Richardson, you and Jim correct me on some of this timetable, but over the last couple of years, we have gone through a pretty lengthy process with a consultant to create a Parks and Rec master plan. 
that uh, we paid a consultant to come in and assist the city with. We had a lot of citizen involvement. We asked for priorities. Um, we asked for input. Um, part of that process is we took into account the inventory of facilities that we have in a city that our citizens use, either private or public. And so we took all that into account, we listened to our citizens, and then we made we made a priority list, a five-year plan that we've committed $40 million of the taxpayers' money to improve the parks and rec facilities of our community. I would have to believe when all those determinations and thoughts were going forth that Health Plus was sitting there something that was a known entity to us, that it had facilities for exercise and weightlifting and group fitness and swimming pools. And that was part of our consideration as to what we needed to do and what and it was part of the consideration from the citizens to tell us what they wanted in their city. And my guess is most people thought that that was their place and they were content. And so here we are in year one beginning the process of building some of these new facilities and the game has changed on us. And so that's, I just want y'all to understand where we're coming from and our planning and what we're dealing with as a community trying to be responsive to the people who hire us to come up here and make these determinations on your behalf that we have gone to a pretty lengthy effort to try to listen to you and, and try to glean from you what your desire is for how you want your city to function in the future. And so we'll go back and we'll talk to them about this and I have no idea what the reaction is. This is their facility, their private entity, they own it. Um, I do believe they'll take our phone call. Um, Health Plus, um, you know, on a personal level, I mean, it's a place that I spoke of at my dad's funeral. I mean, he lived there for three hours a day, three or four days a week. His community was there. Um, if he was still here today, he'd be sitting with y'all. And he'd be chewing me out, telling me to do something about it. Um, he loved that place and loved the people that he worked out with and he saw at his time there. And so, on a personal level, it's a very meaningful place to me, and I'm sorry um, for all of y'all, because it's more than just a place to exercise. I know it's a place that you smile at people and keep up with people and you receive energy from and, um, and friendships from. So, it's, I think it's a great loss for our community that it's gonna be gone. I just wanted to say that. Mr. Jackson, your turn. L.B. Jackson, 814 North College. I first want to say that uh, I visited Health Plus because of my former athlete, and I'm down with the seniors because I'm a senior. I have knee problems sometimes, and even though I have to bend down on my knees to be able to exercise in that four-foot pool, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very lovely place. And uh, I want to say to you guys that uh, having somewhat of a little bit of an inside scoop on what's happening. I have friends that are on the board at the hospital and they are considering keeping just the pool. So once Ron makes that uh, phone call in the morning, I hope that I am as right as my friends tell me it is. So, but I didn't come to address that particular issue. <laughs> I came to address the issue that has been an issue for quite some time. And that is the Richland Road. Issue. I met with Ron, I met with three or four other council people out there, city manager, Allison Frazier. I am here to find out what happened to our plan to do something about that side of Richland Road. There's a mid-block crossing there that goes nowhere where if, a, if you're coming onto Richland Road off of Shub Jordan Parkway, coming up making that sharp sweep of a turn and a kid is coming across that road, you won't see that kid unless he's my height. So you could easily wipe out a kid or, or do some, some bodily in, in, uh, injuries to that kid when you come off of Dunford Drive because the city acquired the right of way and at that time I was a spokesman for the church there. But since that time we've had our differences and nothing has been done. There is a hill that just a tremendous slope about something I guess would say uh, it's about an 8 and 12 or something in, in the construction world. Uh, it just drops off. Erosion is taking place. Mud, other silk and everything washes out in the street. 
if you have to stop suddenly for someone that's coming off a Dunford Drive, and then if there's something in the road of that person can't see because of that heel that was supposedly going to be tapered down, uh, that person will get wiped out coming off of Dunford. But this is something that I've talked about for at least a year and a half. But, you know, it, you get tired of beating a dead horse. I waited for six, eight months for something to happen because so much was going on out there. That's the ugly side of Richmond Road if you're coming off of Sugar Jordan Parkway. And the church, such a small congregation, a lot in terms of what they need to do on their own. I'd like to just have Allison uh, address or someone tell me what mayor is going to ever get done there. Okay, thank you. Mr. Buston, do we have an update on that project that we can respond to Mr. Jackson on? Uh, we don't. We, we have the plan of what we're going to do. We're working with the church, and we will, we will do it. Is there a timetable on that? Um, I don't think we have an exact timetable. Do we have it? That falls under Mr. Woody's jurisdiction in the Public Works Department. We're performing the work ourselves. We have a lengthy work schedule. It is on our work program. I do not have a date based on other project priorities. We do them in the order of which they're on the work program, and we're getting much closer to this one, but I don't have a start date until we finish up a few other things. We'll keep the city manager who, inf who informed who will let you know when we plan to proceed, but it's absolutely been on the work schedule the entire time so in, since we passed a lengthy agreement with the church not that long ago. Are we, are we talking a year, six months, two years again? I'll just say, Mr. Jackson. Do we think, do we believe that, um, as Mr. Jackson does, that there's a significant safety issue? No. We do not believe that. Our <coughs> engineers have told us they do not believe there's a safety issue out there, which I guess would rise to the sense of urgency of the project or Correct. Uh, one of but the factors. Well, well I, I would like to say something on that because just being in that area and I've come through and, you know, giving out signs and stuff like that, that hill is a safety issue. You know, the sidewalk and the other stuff maybe can wait, but the way, if you're coming off Dunford, Dunford that is a huge safety issue because my car like to get hit because you have to pull your car all the way out before you can even see what's coming in a, in a certain direction. So it is a big safety issue as far as that hill right there where the church at. You know, we went out there. So that is a safety issue. So I don't see how, how, how that was determined that that's not a safety issue because it is and I've experienced it several times. So I don't know who came up with that determination. Mr. Buston, can we can we just get an up? Could you and Miss Miss Crouch just give us maybe if the council would allow um, the staff just to give us an update on when they project that project? We can we can get back to you. Yeah. On that. Yeah, that'd be uh, great. But well, we'll get back to you on that. Yeah, that'd be fine. If you'll just get back to us. That'd be fine. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Uh, Linda Dean, 474 Scott Street. Uh, first of all, I know that City Council has often has many serious issues to debate and make decisions about. Uh, it's not an easy task what you all do. And I do appreciate it, and I think our citizens do also. Uh, pertaining to the uh, upcoming survey, um, I also think that what you all could do is include some questions on that survey that are specific to the problems that you all are currently grappling with as well as have grappled with in the past to get some genuine feedback from your citizens in a formal survey that is worded correctly. I think this would be immensely useful to you all when you're making decisions. So um, most of you do have Facebook pages. Why don't you solicit contributions from your citizens? And I know those questions will have to be carefully selected. Uh, as Mr. Buston said, 
there's cer certain questions that you want to follow the trend on. But there are also questions that are specific to our community. There are problems. And you all want to, to feel, I guess, when you vote that you are representing your constituents. How can you know that unless you gather uh, what you hope is representative input from them? And the survey could be a legitimate instrument for doing this, not just a list of your friends on Facebook saying, well, this is what I think. Uh, but I, I hope that you all will, will follow through with that. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Hello, I'm Jan Newton. I live at 728 Cotswold Way, Auburn. Um, I second the need about the, sur the safety issue at Shug Jordan and Richland Road at turning up the hill there. It's very, very dangerous. Um, but my main reason I'm here is about the Health Plus pool and other facilities that are going to be lacking at the new facility. Um, but first, I wanted to say thank you for your willingness and desire to try to address the situation of a therapeutic pool, at least in the meantime, until maybe Auburn can build one. Um, I wanted to say that not only the seniors or older people need the pool, but also younger people use the pool for um, whenever they've had an injury and they're rehabbing, or they've had um, athletes are doing, you know, having a um, knee replacement, things like that, the pool is an excellent benefit for that. And the heated pool is 85 to 86 degrees, typically. And that's very different from a regular olympic size pool that's general aquatic center, because most of those type of athletes like it cooler so they, because they're sweating and they're, you know, they're working out really, really at a different level or different pace. So that's the, the therapeutic value is really important of the heated pool. Um, also, the, um, someone mentioned the new facility, smaller facility at, at the mall that Health Plus is planning. I um, went over the plans with um, a couple of the trainers. There's no shower facilities planned, no indoor track, no pool, of course, no group fitness classes, because there will be no um, dance or aerobic studio or yoga studio, no classes for, um, and I've been searching around the area um, for classes for seniors or for people who have injuries or arthritis, um, fitness classes like the yoga and um, a lighter level Pilates group classes, things like that. And Health Plus was, you know, fulfilling those needs, but they won't be able to if there's newer facility. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you for the council. Do I have a move to adjourn?